I'm going to take a little bit of time today and I'm going to try to expand upon the first two presentations which I thought were very excellent. Y'all did a wonderful job and I will focus specifically with amino acids and try to make some conclusions based on least cost formulation. Uh, we know we have uh, intestinal issues, uh, we know we have importance with mucin, uh, how can we model, how can we calculate, how can we change our diets uh, to be ready uh, to predict uh, these situations and uh, feed birds more effectively. Uh, in doing so, I've got uh, five sections here that I will um, I'll hit. They're, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty uh, quick, uh, and I'll go through these fairly regimentally. Um, give a little bit of overview in uh, the United States, a review on digestive systems, some recent research, and then focus on the intestine. So that's the, that's the outline today. So let's start and um, talk about some trends in the United States. This is more of a trend. This is a historical projection, if you can see this, uh, hopefully, in the, in the back of the room. But this is an uh, overview of amino acid use in the United States. So we have our uh, methionine, which is uh, use in the United States on this line here uh, from the 1960s, which follows the poultry consumption in the United States. And then we have adoption of lysine, threonine, and valine with the adaptation of inclusion of the next crystalline amino acid. We have a reduction in protein. Uh, this is just a hypothetical outline of what we see from this use in the United States. We don't have the lowest protein diets in the world, but we've got pretty low protein diets as a result of uh, the inclusion of these amino acids and the corn, soy, uh, low density type diets that we feed birds uh, in the United States. Uh, what are our trends? Uh, let's just take uh, energy for 15 years. Uh, we're feeding less energy than we ever have. Uh, part of this is due to the bird that we're feeding today. Uh, we get a better bird every year. It's more responsive to amino acids, more responsive to uh, density based on improvements in feed conversion and and uh, downtimes uh, are much quicker with this bird that we have. Um, yes, it responds to energy later, but as a general trend, we're feeding less energy than we ever have in the United States. What about digestible lysine? We take a 15-year <coughs> response, and we're feeding much more digestible lysine. And uh, we're doing that based on the bird that we have, and we're adjusting these uh, digestible lysine levels with typical profiles that would follow that of an ideal amino acid concept that we're using. So this one's interesting. Uh, this is uh, processing weights. Uh, Dr. Applegate mentioned uh, some of the size birds that we have. If you look at the eight-year trend, so we have uh, 2010 versus 2018, 3.4 to a 4.2 kilo bird. That would be uh, the, the big bird type program. So that's not all our chickens. This would be about 40% of them that we call the big bird type program. So this increase has stopped. Okay, why is it stopped? It stopped because of myopathies. We're not increasing at the rate we have. Why do we feed a big bird anyway? Why are we doing that? The processing plant shackle doesn't know the difference between a two kilo bird and a four kilo bird. So we're increasing fixed costs over variable costs in our processing plants because we're completely integrated. That's why we're doing it. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about uniformity in some of the research we have. But we've, this is a trend that we have that's a very interesting one. The last trend I'll talk about is uh, what we're doing with uh, antimicrobial type feed additives. Um, we have a lot of tools. Uh, the tools work. But we as a, as a country and an industry have made voluntary bans, sorry, voluntary decisions with no band uh, to feed uh, diets that are basically antimicrobial free. So we have uh, trends in the United States. One is uh, NAE, never uh, antibiotics ever. And we have many companies that are under this uh, regime. So if they, they have a situation where based on welfare, they need to feed an antimicrobial, those birds are routed to a different supply chain. And one of the things that we've experienced recently is, you know, the chick quality. Uh, chick quality is something that we're having a difficult time with in the United States. The seven-day uh, mortality rates, and, and please understand, in the NAE program, uh, we've pulled out uh, everything in the hatcheries as well. So that, that 
won't, will not allow us to use any uh, antimicrobial in, in, during uh, incubation. So it's a big challenge, and that sets up uh, the presentation for amino acid use in the intestine uh, for the new environment uh, that many of our integrators are experiencing. So section two is a review. Um, it's a review to just think about the digestive dynamics uh, to, to the previous speakers, just kind of an overview on some things that are happening with specific reference to protein. So first of all, uh, the bird, the avian system, has a unique ability to immediately uh, drop uh, the pH uh, as, as the uh, uh, proteins are entering the lumen. And when they do enter the lumen, we have our endogenous enzymes based on trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidases A and B uh, to take the hydrophilic exposed amino acids and begin to break them down into classes of individual amino acids and dientripeptides of which are going to enter the unstirred water layer and be absorbed uh, into the intestine. So the point uh, on this is first pass. First pass is something that has been investigated <coughs> much more in swine uh, in, in terms of numerous uh, laboratories that have evaluated uh, the, the first pass intestinal needs. It's important in this uh, presentation because we're talking about an intestine that is requiring more amino acids based on the environment of which it exists. So first pass is important because this villi uh, environment will utilize everything available to maintain its integrity, which completely changes our least cost formulation outlay if we have challenges that we haven't corrected for in formulation. So in this cartoon, and I'll show it one more time through the presentation, but basically uh, we have our uh, villi with the enterocytes with a goblet cell in the middle, another one here, peptides coming in, amino acids coming in into particular uh, uh, the vascular system. However, keep in mind that they may never enter the vascular system. In some amino acids, we can calculate 30 to 40 percent use uh, in these systems, depending upon uh, the mucus that's going to be needed for glycocalus or for the mucus that's in the unstirred water layer, both of which have a tremendously fast half-life and a tremendous uh, uh, pull on the amino acids uh, from absorption, or before absorption, excuse me. So let me back up and talk about some recent research we have to set up formulation and the ideal protein concept. Uh, this is work that was just completed uh, by um, a visiting scholar, uh, Sonia Liu from Australia. Some of her colleagues are here. Uh, she'll be presenting this work at uh, the International Poultry Scientific Forum in February in 2019. So we looked at lysine responses and in doing so, <coughs> we cal calculated their responses in a classical type environment whereby we were deficient uh, to be excessive. And in doing so, there's a number of different uh, diets that you can use. I put this slide here just to give us a background of how we can look at some of these amino acids. Uh, total sulfurs, they're pretty easy. The first limiting amino acid, uh, lysine, which we're going to show. You can use corn glutamine because or, sorry, cor corn gluten meal, because it's a perfect uh, ingredient to reduce uh, dietary lysine, but the problem is it affects feed intake. So I used to use it in the 1990s. I don't use it anymore because the lysine responses were, were so different. So what we do is we use peanut meal, which is uh, very high in arginine, so you can't use it for arginine, but you can use it some for lysine. Peanut meal again for threonine. Uh, valine presents a little bit of an issue because I'll show you uh, a graph that shows it's a fourth limiting amino acid and there's a little bit of a difficulty in determining its responses because you can't get valine that deficient. Uh, blood cells are beautiful for isoleucine, so you can create some beautiful isoleucine works and diets that are pretty practical. And I know some regions of the world still use a lot of blood cells and gelatin with tryptophan and arginine. Um, really there's not much uh, to look at arginine, but uh, the responses vary so much. I'll talk about that. You can, you can see some responses and I'll present some of those. So the work that we uh, looked at was uh, pretty uh, intensive for, for lysine. Uh, we had 144 floor pins where we looked at male titration, female titration with uh, both positive and negative controls. <clears throat> and then we deboned everything. We deboned uh, all the breasts, all the thighs, uh, pretty much all the parts of these birds. So these diets are uh, peanut meal based diets we have here. Um, you see 10% peanut meal coming in uh, both diets with the low and the high lysine. If we come down here to look at the lysine in the diets, 
0.03 versus 0.38. So a uh, very high uh, inclusion of L-lysine. Uh, with that said, diets were blended. So in, in the low diet, uh, we don't have any uh, threonine, valine. We have uh, no isoleucine either. Here you see them coming in as we set all ratios of essential amino acids to equal one another, and we blended the diets. We used two controls because we wanted to show uh, how an industry-type diet with no peanut meal, uh, where we had uh, about 0.16, which is more relevant uh, to the industry versus a much higher level uh, with peanut meal as a negative control. Uh, we had no effects of the controls, so we validated our responses. So I'll, I'll show you the nutrients, and then I'll show you the responses. So these are the, the diets that we had in this grower period on nutrient availability. So if we, uh, if we follow lysine here, uh, we start at 0.84 digestible to 1.29. You see our two controls at 1.1. Uh, protein levels varied from 19 to 22. And here they're at 20% in both the controls. So that's the outlay of the, uh, the nutrients. So these are the responses uh, in the male and the female birds. Uh, interestingly, uh, we have a higher response for body weight gain in the female bird in terms of a requirement, which we don't typically see this. She didn't respond as the males did, uh, but she has a level here that's higher as opposed to the males. Uh, contrary to that, in feed conversion, uh, we see the female bird with a nice response with a lower uh, digestible lysine, 1.1 versus over 1.2 uh, for the male response. So here, 1.1 versus 1.22. So that would mimic past research a little bit closer uh, to what's been done. So here we have um, responses in terms of CV and uh, also abdominal fat. <clears throat> so the CV you see uh, with the, uh, the male bird is a little bit steeper. Uh, the reason being is uh, these birds grow faster than females, so there's more innate variability that occurs more amino acids based on the lysine and amino acid densities, improving that uniformity. I think this is important in a lot of parts of the world. In the United States, it's not so important because we're going to use second stage processing to improve our uniformity based on DSI water jets cutting portions of meat like we need to for retail distribution as opposed to many parts of the world that have to improve uniformity by nutrition. So an important point there. Abdominal fat. Uh, if we look at lysine concentration here with the, uh, the male, uh, is, is a little bit flatter because females have more whole body fat, so she, her slope is a little bit steeper. Uh, lastly, on, on the yields, this is the last slide to show, but this is a breast meat yield. Uh, we see the response to the females is nice, but it's a much lower response than the males, uh, one versus, say, over 1.2. And then if we look at thighs, for example, we see a decrease uh, uh, also here in terms of percent for both males and females. We always see this. Uh, it's a proportion of the bird. Uh, you, you can't get something without giving up another thing. So we're having more breasts, so we get less uh, dark meat yields. Okay. So in summary, we look at the females, um, 1.15 on average versus over 1.2 for males. 7-8% uh, higher need uh, for the male, which is in agreement with the lit literature. I preface this because it's new research, and I want you to think about the ideal protein concept. We did this work because uh, it's a, the new bird in the United States with a cob. It's the new MX uh, male on the 500 female. Everything we have is fast feather. Uh, so there's very little research on this bird. So we were setting this up to assess this, this new cob to see how this would respond. Uh, keep in mind when we're looking at ideal protein, uh, we've got a pretty good idea on threonine, uh, but Leandro Hackenhauer and I uh, set this up. These are least cost formulation runs we did years ago, and we did this just, just to think about the fourth limiting amino acid. Um, all vegetable based diets, valine is going to be right up there. Uh, when you bring in the meat meals, uh, you're going to have isoleucine, and depending upon the ingredients, you could be a heavy sorghum based. Uh, grain versus that of corn or wheat, and you're going to have arginine. So you've got three key amino acids. They're going to be limiting after threonine. And the reason I show this is because we're going to talk about the mucin in just a minute, which utilizes all, all of those amino acids. So in the ideal protein concept ratio, you have your, your amino acids rel relative to lysine. We have a limitation order here, 
And the question is, in formulation, how do we, uh, how do we adjust for environmental stimuli and, and different things that come into play? So let's talk about uh, this fourth section, which is uh, the, the, the last big one before I make some conclusions and there's some current research that I'll show. But intestinal versus whole body needs of amino acids uh, relative to uh, an infection or a challenge or a coccidia, as Dr. Applegate mentioned in his presentation. So I go back to this uh, slide that we show in terms of keep in mind with first pass needs, the intestinal villi based on the unstirred water layer and the membrane associated mucus as well as the mucus that's in the unstirred water layer are going to have first priority period uh, regardless uh, of the situation because they're going to uh, obtain these amino acids uh, prior to any absorption that takes place. So which amino acids are going to be primarily in play? Uh, this is uh, past research that we looked at threonine. This was very intensive research that uh, Dr. Corser and I uh, worked at, uh, at Mississippi State University. So we had the dirty and the clean environments. And many of you might say, well, how, do you, how did you do that? You, you can't have a house of dirty and you can't have a house of clean because when you set up the experiments, you have no replication. So what you do is you have to do it in one house. So we basically went into the pens and we stapled plastic around the pens uh, so the birds could not peck uh, across. Uh, in these types of pins, and then we in inserted either uh, clean, uh, unused shavings or shavings from built-up flocks, and that's how we did the research. Um, in doing so, we, we saw responses that were uh, much higher uh, for birds for th responding to threonine and dirty environments. We hypothesized five, six, seven, eight percent more, but in reality, you can't make that conclusion uh, because it's a linear response. So. In the dirty environment, the birds kept responding to threonine, okay? Uh, let's look at breast meat yield. This is the, um, uh, the, the pectoralis major. Uh, this is the response relative to the weight of the, the live bird. And if you, look at the, um, if you look at the response here in the dirty environment, uh, the bird keeps responding to threonine. So why, why the response to threonine? First of all, you have a mucus play Okay, so you need more threonine, and the reason you see it in breast, there's nothing responsive in breast meat regarding threonine. This is an ideal protein, lipeg barrel type response. Okay, threonine is, is important for maintenance, lysine is not. Lysine is the first limiting amino acid before threonine, so if you have deficient threonine, lysine efficiency ratio is reduced. That's all we're seeing here. This is a lysine response even though we're looking at threonine, okay? So this is, this is the, the classic lipeg barrel effect that actually shows the response, okay? The second point about this is the bird does not stop responding to threonine, okay? Very important. If you're in a situation in parts of Asia where you have birds on wire, okay, this is a, this is a money maker. Do you need 0 0.65, 0 0.67 digestible threonine to lysine ratio? Maybe you need 61, 62, 63. You really need to investigate it because that's a point of either making money or losing money. Okay, in dirty environments, 68, 69, 70. I don't know if you need that much, but this shows the fact that it really responds. So it's very interesting. Also, uh, work at uh, Scothurst uh, by Star. She looked at uh, 308 males and showed a very similar response uh, of increasing threonine on a controlled, in fact, we just used dirty litter. She used a subtherapeutic clostridia uh, to create a not, uh, necrotic enteritis response and, and saw a nice increase in terms of threonine need. So I pulled this from a past review that Brian Kerr and I wrote just to think about um, catabolism of threonine through glucogenogenic pathways. Threonine primarily is going to be catabolized in the autolase and the dehydrogenase pathways in poultry, both going to glycine. So when we think about mucin and we think about threonine, it's important to understand that the catabolism of threonine is going to be supplying glycine, of which uh, serine and glycine are going to be interchangeable in the role for mucin. So all three amino acids are very, very important in terms of mucin. So let's move to the fourth limiting amino acid. And this is a slide, it's a, it's a scatter plot uh, that I took from a previous presentation of valine. And this is looking at just male broilers. All the, the data that's published 
in the literature that, that I could find. And this is over the age of the birds as a ratio to lysine. So if we look here in the 70s and we show that also one important point, it increases, right? The amino acid requirement increases as the bird ages. Do we think about it that way? We should for these, these amino acids that are involved in mucin. Why? Because we express them relative to lysine. And lysine has no maintenance requirement. It's all for protein synthesis. So as we express these amino acids relative to lysine, they're all going to increase with age. Think about it. Threonine at 63, 64, you increase it as a bird ages. The same with valine. The same with isoleucine. The reason is is because of mucin. Okay? <clears throat> so that's one point. But we see some variability here. Um, I won't go through this in this presentation, but we have work in female broilers that we have a lot of variability. In fact, so much variability, we're doing more work in it before we present it to make sure we're not presenting it wrong uh, because we want to make sure when we, we present this work, we're, we're covering the, the responses right, but we're seeing some variability. But in terms of males, uh, why can this variability exist? It's important to note the branch chain amino acid responses from mucine. This is through the alpha ketoglutarate pathway. Much of this, the, the reason I made this slide, much of this uh, information I got from sitting down with Dr. Ed Moran, uh, having uh, a few beverages with him, and going through uh, pathways and talking about mucin and mucin needs. Uh, but basically, isoleucine, leucine, and valine, all uh, through the alpha ketoglutarate pathway are gonna make glutamine, which is going to enter the blood back through the enterocyte for mucin. So very important with these branched chain amino acids. So in the, in the low protein type diets, we have the all vegetable base where you're gonna have valine potentially as fourth limiting. When you bring in the meat meals, you're gonna have isoleucine as fourth limiting. These are gonna be pressure points in least cost formulation. So that's where the money's at and that you're gonna be tempted to decrease these levels, okay? They're very important mucin. So it's a very interesting concept. The other one that we have not talked about uh, and the last one, uh, very important that I want to cover is arginine. This is a review uh, that I wrote uh, many years ago, but there's some work in this review that's buried and it never got published anywhere else. Uh, we, we looked at arginine in uh, coxie uh, responses where we, we received some coxie from uh, the east coast of the United States. It was uh, acervulina, uh, intonella, and maxima mixture. And we, we, give these, we gave birds coccidia and we looked at responses to arginine. I'll just show one effect. Uh, this is in livability. And I show this because you, we've never really been able to show an effect like this in a floor pen type trial. But we show, showed an improvement to arginine in the livability of the birds in a coccidia based uh, challenge environment. Um, body weight gain uh, uh, fluctuated a little bit. So the, the point is, is you got a response here that's flat and then you see this. Okay, this goes back to, to work. Um, if I can refer back to the group from Australia that uh, Derek Balnave did years ago with, with arginine. One of, the, one of the issues is when you look at these levels here, uh, how do you get it? Well, well, you don't. I mean, if you feed peanut meal, you might be able to get this in a diet. You could feed L-arginine, but in reality, the only way practically you're going to get this is higher levels of soybean meal with increase the entire diet density of amino acids. So it's not practical. So we're, we, we basically don't go over 1.07, 1 1.08 1 uh, with an arginine to lysine ratio because there's just no other way to get it. So it's something to think about, uh, but based on the effects of arginine on mucin, uh, but also something that practically it's, it's hard to get to. So in terms of these amino acids for both the, the mucin and the um, unstirred water layer and, the, and then the membrane mucus, we have third limiting and also serine and glycine, which catabolized from third limiting, fourth limiting, potentially fourth limiting, potentially fourth limiting, and then leucine, which is an uninvestigated wild card that we need to know more about. We have a research trial that we're starting. Uh, we just re we're receiving eggs this week, and then from those eggs, uh, we'll hatch chicks, and we have a box beacon design where we're looking at valine, leucine, and isoleucine with 13 randomized treatments. Uh, this is something that Dr. Sonia Liu is doing at the University of Arkansas, and hopefully we're going to get a better handle on these branch-chain amino acid responses. 
So I put up a hypothetical model uh, to think about. Uh, this model is, 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 is kind of radical, but basically when you have your ideal protein concept, uh, be prepared in certain environments in reality to have something like this. So even though you think you're paying for this, you're getting this because of the high demand in the intestinal epithelial based on the environment. So this is a, this is a situation of profit is what we're looking at here based on formulation and how do we set up the formulation to predict the responses that we're gonna have in the birds. So lastly, I'll have a couple of slides uh, on some current research and uh, then we're, uh, I'll, make, uh, I'll stop. So Marcus, I'm glad you, you showed uh, your, your uh, research on the microbiome because I won't, <laughs> but I wanna let the audience know what we're doing. Uh, we have uh, a large investigation of microbiome, and I know it's complex, but we're working with Dr. Yunming Kwan's lab. And basically what we're doing is we're setting up studies where we have controls, and then we reduce the protein, corn soy-based diets, and then we come in with more amino acids on a surfat level. So this would be more adequate, this is more practical, and this is also practical. So basically, we're only looking at corn, soy ratios moving with crystalline amino acids coming in the diet. And then we have multiple experiments that go on at once. So we'll hatch eggs, say uh, 4,000, 5,000 uh, eggs. We'll get chicks. We'll sex them. So we'll have siblings placed, male, female, it's across the farm. And we have different experiments and are pulling samples of just positive control, negative control, uh, surfeit diets, three different, so being very, very practical to pull these microbiomes to look at what's happening. Um, Professor Kwan in past has uh, collaborated. Uh, this is with the Hargis lab where they're looking at uh, necrotic enteritis and they have different uh, microbiome platforms uh, versus this collaboration with Dr. Weidman where they're looking at uh, the, the broilers on the floor model where they have uh, lameness that they're inducing, that they're looking at microbiome. And now we've set up a series of experiments to work with him uh, to look at uh, the uh, different amino acid density, basically, for microbiome. I thought we'd have that data, Pierre-André, and then I found out when they were in the lab how difficult it was to get everything. So forthcoming, maybe in some advance in the future, okay? So what I want to uh, finish on is just to say, with the formulation models that we have, we have the third limiting, the fourth limiting, the co-fourth limiting, and fifth limiting amino acids. These are pressure points in least cost formulation. These are, you're gonna be tempted to move these amino acids based on the ingredients you're using and the costs associated with maintaining the minimums, but these are on the front line of defense for the bird. So it's so important to understand the situation the bird is going through, uh, to be able to model or predict how the formulation can be set up for the environment you're in at the same time in certain situations where you know you don't have stress, there's an awful lot of money that can be made by lowering the amino acid minimums as well. And I'm gonna finish with, with that, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation, and I think due to the time, we, you may pick just one You're in of charge. the questions. You're in charge, I'm gonna do one then. So start with the top maybe, because it has two. Should we reconsider our arginine recommendations and modulate according to rearing conditions? I think yes, yes. We need to look more at arginine. Um, keep in mind, uh, one of the problems with arginine is uh, titrating it. It's hard to do, so I wouldn't worry about titrating it. I would just formulate a lower level of ar arginine, which in a practical diet, you can probably get down to 0.9596 as a ratio to lysine. And then you can add L-arginine, for example and get back to where you practically would be at 105 to 110 max, but then say, okay, 115, 120 with L-arginine, uh, how is this gonna affect different rearing conditions? I think it's very important to look at, uh, especially in different environments around the world, and, and reassess that response in your condition. So yes. You're, okay, thank you very yeah. much. Short answer. Yeah. Gives us yeah, yeah. some more time. Um, I think we move on. You move on, okay, and thank you.